Hi guys, I'm here today to run through how to use an ion chromatograph system. And here we're working with the Dynex ICS90. And this is just basically the measurement and separation system here. This moves on to the software and computing part of the processes. So the ion chromatograph system we're doing today uses gas pressure and runs through on a mobile phase of sodium carbonate and sodium bicarbonate. Our sample is injected through this port here. And then it moves on to the injection loop passing through two iron chromatograph columns, and then moves on to a suppressor, and then a detector, which then converts our results into electrical signals, which are picked up by our matching software and computing system here. Our mobile phase is responsible for carrying our unknown solution through the chromatograph column. Now, depending on our pH, concentration, and type of mobile phase, we will determine later on how our sample is separated in the chromatographic column. Now, usually this is all set up for you previously before the lab, so you don't have to worry about the concentration pH of our mobile phase. So once we inject our one mil solution, it moves on to our injection loop. And for this system, we use a 10 microliter injection loop, which means that only 1% of our one mil sample is retained in this loop. And while the system is in the low position, it means that the mobile phase is bypassing this injection loop. Once we click inject on the software program, it opens a small valve, which means that the mobile phase passes onto the injection loop, pushing our sample further onto the chromatographic column. After our sample is injected into the system, it passes through a guard column, which moves any particulates or contaminants in the system. It then flows onto an end column, which is the iron chromatographic column. And this is packed full of our stationary phase, and for this system it's made up of a polystyrene amorphous resin. And depending on the system used and the types of analytes that we're testing for, these types of resins can change. And a list of these resins can be found generally in most textbooks. So after our solution passes through the chromatographic column, it enters our suppressor. And in our suppressor we have a cation exchange membrane with sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid will react with the carbonate and bicarbonate of our mobile phase, neutralizing it as carbon dioxide and water. This is done to ensure that our diagnostic peaks are coming out clear in our rear because the carbonate and bicarbonate from the mobile phase is a higher conductivity than a lot of the analytes will be testing for. After our solution passes through the suppressor, it moves on to our detector. And for this particular machine, our detector measures conductivity. And once the conductivity is measured, it's transferred into electrical signals and passed onto our software interface. The software interface records the changes in conductivity and plots them on this graph here. The zero line for our conductivity is generally measured against the background reading of our mobile phase, and the conductivity is measured in micro scenes. So when the system is ready to receive a sample, this is indicated by a pop-up box which appears on the main screen. And this is telling you that it's okay to load the sample. This is also indicated by the valve status down here in the corner, saying that it's also in the load position. Now that we're dealing with our sample, it's important that we use the proper safety gear. In this case, it forms a lab coat and our safety glasses. Now the instrument we're using is very sensitive, and even though it has a guard column, it's still important that we filter our sample first. And for this, we use a small detachable filter that we put on the end of our syringe. And these filters filter out particles at 0.45 micrometers big, so that's quite fine. Before we inject our sample, we usually take three or four pumps with our syringe and rinse out our filter. From there, we place our filter and our syringe on the injection port. And slowly, with gentle pressure, push our solution into the system. Now, it's a good idea to keep your finger on the syringe and keep the pressure in there. We reach across onto the software interface and in the pop-up box we click OK. While the sample is running, you will notice that a small peak will appear in a dipping fashion before the other analytic peaks come into play. This is generally from the solution our analyte is dissolved in, and in this case it's water. And it has a lower peak because it has a lower conductivity than the mobile phase which passes through the system. When an analyte passes through the stationary phase, it will come out in the detector it appears on the screen as a predominant peak. Well, whilst this sample is running, which may take 5 or 10 minutes, you can click back to the recording spreadsheet. And here you can go to a previously finished sample and name it so you have a record of the samples you've tested. To do this, you click on the sample, hit F8, it'll come up with a pop-up bar where you can name your sample. In this case, the first sample that we've tested is a calibration plate. Once you've named your sample, if you double click on it, it will bring up the peak integration, and from here you can print out your results. After we click print on the interface, this is what the raw output will come out like. And there's two things that are the main concern for us, and that is the retention time, 
which corresponds to the time the anions take to come off the chromatographic column, and also the peak area, which corresponds to the concentrations of anions in solution. Okay, the first step we do with our raw output is determine which peaks correspond to different anions in our solution. From there, we then go to our peak areas and we plot them on a spreadsheet which corresponds to the concentration of our original sample that we used. After we do this to a range of concentrations, we then create a calibration curve which we use to determine the concentrations of our unknown. So now that we've gone through a quick run through of the ion chromatographic system, you should have a basic understanding of how this works in a laboratory situation.